I'm not sure which one it is.
didn't get out there. I didn't have time. Yeah. So we're west of Seattle. Oh, you are? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Right. Okay. I wanted to get there because I did the Veneer thing and, and, and I got over that.
Hello, hello. This is our five minute, uh, five minute head start warning before we begin. And if uh, make certain that you have your meal choice and uh, name card sitting out at your seating place. Five minute warning.
Hello, everyone. Hello. Can I get your attention? Oh, can I get your attention, please? If we could, uh, everybody, just uh, start heading to your seats, please. And uh, again, make sure you have your name card, the uh, tent in the back of here. If you could just set that in front of your seats, that'd be great. Thank you very much.
I just remember she was she was cool. Steve Crawford, calling Steve Crawford. Come to the head table, please. We're going to go ahead and begin with our customary introduction of the exec committee members and special guests. So please welcome to our banquet, everyone. We're, we're still rounding up our final few, but I think we're doing okay on that. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with this side of the table by the name, wait, my name is Waylena McCulley and if you haven't figured that out already, I am the current, <laughs> not for very long, the current president of the Great Lakes Planetarium Association and I'm just so thrilled to be here with everyone. Oh, just love you all so much. I'd like to introduce uh, at the table, at the end over here, we have our secretary, Tiffany Stone Walbrick. 
I, which I know I'm, I'm tripping over all of my, all of my words today. Uh, Mike Smale, our final IPS rep. <laughs> President-elect, only for a few more months, Dan Tell. And I'm going to skip to the end of this table, work my way, actually I'm gonna bounce around. So I'm going to go with the elected Steve. <laughs> we joke a lot on which Steve we're talking about. So the elected Steve, treasurer, and so uh, Steve Berklin. And I'm going to now go to the other, to the uh, opposite end there. Mark Reed, and I'm going to come back to him in a moment because he has a few words to say. Middle name Stephen. Oh, wow! Do, do we have Steves over here? Are we going to have a Spartacus moment where everybody stands up and says, "I'm Steve. I am Steve." Uh, we also want to thank our other Steve here, Steve Crawford, who is, uh, he is sitting here as, uh, as part of the host party, but he is also our new development chair. We'll be uh, onboarding him soon for that, so yay. We have our Spitz lecturer, Carrie Berglin, right here. Mark, did you want to say a few uh, more words of thanks to the other uh, members of the of, of your staff? And I figure we could do that right now, and then we'll introduce the rest, and, and we can dig in with you. Good evening. I would like to take a moment here and, and thank so many people who've helped with this cut. I couldn't have done this conference without the guidance of people like Gary Tomlinson, who I sat down with four years ago and had a conversation, and we had numerous conversations for a period of over two years. I'd like to thank and call out Steve Crawford, who's been indispensable. Steve is full-time in his position, and I have kind of a unique part-time position, and so he's picked up a lot of duties, and he, I think he truly loves it. He may want to murder me later, but I think he truly loves it. <laughs> but it, And then I want to call out uh, our staff at the Kalamazoo Valley Museum, our leadership, Dr. Washington, who you heard the other night, uh, Bill McElhone and Lexi Cobb and, and, and Kathy Godin. But there were many, many people who, you know, checked things, cleaned things, got, you know, put food out and did all sorts of support things. And I know that if I started putting together an entire list, I would leave people out. I'd like to thank the staff of the Radisson as well because they've been super throughout the conference and the planning. <laughs> and all of you who have taken the chance to come to Kalamazoo during one of our most unusual times. We're not quite post-pandemic, but man, I am looking forward to a time where some normalcy occurs. So with that, if I've let it, left anybody out, I sincerely apologize, but I'd like to thank everybody for being able to bring this conference together. And I applaud you. Thank you. We'll continue here and we're going to uh, introduce the rest of the exec committee because uh, it takes more than those seated up here to make Flippa do what it does. Uh, in fact, it takes more than the people I'm about to introduce because it takes all of us, each and every one of us, all of us. 
but I'll go ahead and begin the introductions. Now this, I'm not gonna go by the table because uh, I'm just gonna read off my list since I'm alphabetized and I don't want that to go to waste. So, <laughs> Publications Chair, Jackie Bowman. Technology Chair, Tom Dobes. Membership Chair, Paulette Epstein. Education Chair, Peggy Hernandez. Conference Planning Chair, Renee Kerrigan. Now I'm sure I'm going to miss some other people, but I do want to also thank our Virtual Conference Chair, Katie Downing. And our videography team, we've got uh, John Farish, we've got Steve Stuma, I, again, Stuma Press. Steve, you're just wonderful, I'm so sorry, it's all these Steves, right? Um, I'm, all, I'm already, uh, I, I, I did add in a thank for Greg Williams, who is also filling in, helping with that, and Brian Wolf, who is assisting remotely. Everybody leave. So these and many more are the people who make this organization great. Because he's sitting down there, it's like sitting at the kids' table at Thanksgiving. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm gonna make you stand up then. <laughs> our past president and, and, and our conference registrar, Jeff Holt. when he offered to sit down on, on, on the uh, lower table. I was like, oh, I'm gonna miss him, I'm gonna miss him. Okay, I'm sorry, Jeff. <laughs> uh, let's see, who else have I missed? I think, well, Renee, is there anyone in, in particular that you'd like me to add for that? Okay, thank you. Then uh, I think we can go ahead and commence with dinner and I'll be back with uh, another one of those five minute warnings and hopefully it'll actually be five minute warning this time. <laughs> thank you.
This is our five minute warning. Get those restroom breaks in before we continue with the uh, program. Five minute warning. And I'm looking at the clock this time so I know. Ha <laughs> ha. 
Don't mind me, I'm just being ignorant. <laughs> ready to resume the program. I do have an announcement. It is last call for the bar. Emotional support shark. What is it that you have, Ryan? Is that a monkey poster? No, is this, like is, this is a badger. Uh, oh. it's, a, it's a dog toy. It's it's uh, actually one of my. Uh, uh, <laughs> We have 
to give away her secret award at the end of the awards. Right. Is this going to be Okay. Hello. All right, we're going to resume our program now. And but of course, I lost my place already. I promise I have not consumed any alcohol today. Oh, but just you wait, just you wait. Oh, just you wait, we're saving it for sure. All right. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge our sponsors who have joined us for this conference. Uh, I know that uh, quite a few have left already, but some are with us. And uh, I'm going to go ahead just and uh, just go through the list of the sponsors, but I, I, I do want to say that our sponsors support our conference uh, financially to offset the cost, but, but they do so much more than that. They, they share with us solutions to many problems and they present interesting and exciting new tools for reaching our audiences and for telling the stories of science. Uh, so, and of, of course they ask us questions and they listen and that it helps them to improve on their offerings and to develop new products. So it really is a, a, a true symbiotic relationship and we could not, we could not do this without them. So I'm going to go ahead and um, you know feel free to uh, shout out as uh, if there's anyone here that uh, is in these companies. I'm just in the interest of time going to go through the list and uh, see. We have folks here from Cosm. I, I saw one hand kind of wave a little bit like this shyly, and and Michael, I've never seen you be shy before. So grateful to have everyone here. This is wonderful. Let's see. And uh, I finally figured out how to pronounce it. Sia Technologies. So. <laughs> and Skyscan. Yes. I must also say and Skyscan. I was just told. Sorry about that. It's George's fault. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, Ash Enterprises. <laughs> I love that we can say these names again. This is great. Uh, Goto Inc. Siler Instrument, Zeiss, yes. Associated Universities Inc. Where'd she go? There she is. Astrotech Manufacturing. I know they had to leave, but uh, it was so good to get to get to see their offerings. Uh, Bowen Technovation. Yes. Digitalis Education Solutions. <laughs> Discover Kalamazoo. <laughs> Konica Minolta Planetarium. <laughs> Laser Fantasy. <laughs> Milwaukee Public Museum. <laughs> Adler Planetarium. Audio Visual Imagineering. <laughs> and California Academy of Science. <laughs> Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you so very much. Next up is the uh, oh the the, uh, the the part that's the part that's always very sad and heart heartwarming. Um, however, for our remembrance time, I did not see any losses for this last year, losses of planetariums. Uh, does anyone have any from the floor? Oh. Oh. Yes, Alan Pash. Great guy. And, uh, Mark? Yeah, Joe Schultz from the CERN Space Center. 
Thank you. Well, next up comes the fun part that uh, I've been looking forward to for a very long time, and that is the uh, awarding of certificates. So first up, we have the certificate for past president to Jeff Holt, who, uh, he's here. Next up are the, uh, the awards for fellows. And we have quite a few because we are including last year and this year together. The, um, well, uh, first of all, let me see. How many of you here are fellows? Go ahead and show your hands right now. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so we're going to be adding some hands to that. Uh, that count. Uh, so criteria for fellow, active member for 10 years or uh, 10 or more years or active member for five plus years with contributions, uh, elected offices, committee work, volunteering in, in so many different ways, involvement even in state meetings, just a uh, local level, many ways to contribute and I'm so glad that so many of you have. Uh, anyone can nominate a member for the status of fellow. You just get on the website and you can uh, print out the form or submit the form electronically and you do that by the, uh, by the spring equinox. So I do encourage you to do that. So this year we have two new fellows, but uh, again, we did award some last year and we want to acknowledge them this year. So the 2020 fellows are Joe Childers, John Farish, <laughs> Tiffany Stone Walbrecht, who is here, so please come up. <laughs> You're not surprised. <laughs> That's all right. Stephen Sumacris. Joining us virtually, Brian Wolf. We will add two names to that for this year, 2021 fellows. Jackie Bowman. And Clifford Jones. Now you have 
Excuse me for just a moment. I've been looking forward to that for a very long time, so thank you, everyone. So next up, we have honorary life members. In 2020, we awarded honorary life membership to Sue Batson, Buck Batson, and Dave Leak. Dave's still here. Come on up. Come on up. And while Dave is on his way, and Anna gets those pictures. <gasps> oh, Sue Batson's on the line. Oh, okay. I thought maybe Sue Batson's on the line. Well, we have a lot of Steve's. We have a lot. We, we have a few Sue's, but not as many as we have Steve's. <laughs> and I do want to add to the 2020, the 2021 honorary life members, and um, I'm just going to say them together because it works out that way. Greg Williams and Barb Williams. Greg is staffing a camera, so he's having to take a moment to work. See, even now, in, in, in honorary life member, you still get put to work for GLPA. He said he has to get back to work or he'll get fired. <laughs> we do this year have one service award to present. The uh, GLPA service award is uh, an occasional award that is presented to a GLPA member who has performed exceptional and or long time service to the organization. Uh, how many, I, I did not list them out here, uh, uh, cut on time, but Go ahead, raise your hand if you are a service award recipient. Yes. Yes. I love that we keep growing the list of service award um, awardees. So we have one to present this year, Michael McConville. says it is one of the best kept, best kept secrets ever. to not actually tear up as I'm saying this. I'm actually serious. Um, I, I think I was the one that brought it up because, um, geez. <laughs> During the pandemic, um, it was Mike, Michael, that really brought us together in a way that was, was Meaningful. 
And I wanted to make sure that we recognize and every conference coming up for probably a few years now we're going to find people who are meeting each other in person for the first time who got to know each other through those uh, through those meetings so thank you thank you okay i'm not crying you're crying <laughs> Um, because we still have uh, two more awards. <laughs> the Galileo Award is GLPA's highest honor. It recognizes persons of exemplary leadership at the national and or international level. Um, we did award in 2020, but we were hoping to be able to present in person the 2020 Galileo Award, Dr. Ron Kachuk. <laughs> and uh, Mark Reed has just, uh, just a few brief words to say um, on his behalf and will take the responsibility of delivering the award. Um, many, of, many of you know that uh, Dr. Kachuk was um, well, the recipient of the Mentor Award, Mentor to quite a few, several here, to Mark, to my husband. I have a husband because of Ron Kachuk. <laughs> yes, it's, uh, I'm glad to accept this award for Ron. Um, Ron was my uh, graduate advisor at Ball State University. We've had lots of conversations, trips to different places, uh, such as going to Florida uh, for a NASA program where we, we got to see many things during that time of post-Columbia. I've stayed at his house, he's been up to, to my place. We've just continued to have many, many conversations. He's been a, a mentor to me in so many different ways. He's been a personal friend and also, you know, the kind of teacher who guides you. He may, he, he's not going to give you the answer, but he'll keep giving you tools and have you keep trying to get something right. And so I, I was hoping that Ron could be here this evening to accept that. And uh, I hope that he'll be able to join us, but or is or is watching. But uh, Ron has been a mentor not only to me but to Keith Turner and to uh, Waylena's husband Jeff. We didn't even know each other when Ron had us as students because Jeff attended during the class, the traditional school year, and I attended during the summer. And at graduation, we sat next to one another and started talking and we found out we had a common denominator. And so, just so many things. And there's so many people that are deserving of this Galileo Award, but I'm, gonna, I'm biased. Ron is really more of an unsung hero than, than I think we realize. So thank you on behalf of Ron. One more, one more, and then and then and then we move on. I promise. The 2021 Galileo Award winner, Bart Benjamin.
Give me a fart! Wow. <laughs> so Zoom participants Deserved. Zoom participants, we have unmuted uh, so that the whole place can hear you. Uh, so that Bart can say a few words. Wow. I uh, I'm shocked and uh, surprised. Um, this is uh, an amazing uh, honor and a tribute, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it's an exceptional organization and uh, we do great things nationally and internationally. Um, I'm not quite sure why you think me deserving of this, but I thank you from the bottom of my heart and, uh, and uh, I will always regard GLPA as, as the special place and organization that I've been associated with in my life. So uh, thank you again. I'm shocked. I'm dumbstruck, but in a very happy way. Thank you. Well, we certainly are not uh, not shocked. Not just because some of us knew about it, but uh, the the newsletter and taking. Uh, newer planetarians under your wing and getting them involved in ways that is now paying off with uh, members of uh, the exec committee. Um, Bart, your years as state chair, it, it, it goes on and on. So it, it, it should not be that much of a shock. Thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> wow, thank you, thank you. Stop crying and act dignified. Well, so actually, Way, if you give us just a second, there is one more award that you don't know about. Oh, what do we have? You know how we're secretive in, in exec. Um, there was one more award that was nominated for this year, uh, and it's GLPA's Mentor Award. You may recall the Mentor Award was created a few years ago to recognize those who make extraordinary contributions in the field of bringing up the next generation of planetarians. Um, and so several of us on Exec got together and we're very pleased to award the 2021 Mentor Award to Waylene and Macaulay. honor that I could imagine. Oh, I can't wait to speak. Um, I'll try to come up with something later to thank each and every one of you. Um, I think um, we're going to need to take a five minute break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a, a few of us did want to say a few things um, for Willina. I, I think uh, several of us up here have nominated the people who got us involved in this field in the first place for Mentor Award in the past, and it's been awarded. Um, and as, as when this was suggested, it was, of course, immediate that, you know, other people may have brought us into the field, but for so many of us, Waylena was the person who told us not only that we could, but should get involved with Glippa. Um, and, and beyond that, well, I guess <laughs> when Paulette suggested I say a few words, what occurred to me today was, um, there's a self-published book I bought from a guy in a train station once. And it, <laughs> but it had this really like uh, beautiful thing in it which sort of spun into this of, we're all made of stars. Um, you know, we're all compressed stardust. We're made out of, you know, how many stars from how far away. And in that way, that makes each of us constellations. We're an amalgamation of stars and we're drawn together by these links and lines. And although I first met Waylena through Glippa, the actual first link that drew our constellations together was the 1971 progressive rock masterpiece, Tarkus. Um, <laughs> but um, beyond that, I mean, Waylena has done so much for me in my career, in my time in Glippa. You have been a supporter, a teacher, a guide, an encourager, a constant cheerleader. 
I could not be where I am in my career without you, just as you said, you wouldn't have your husband without Ron Kaichuk. I wouldn't be in California with my wife and daughter without Waylena supporting me along the way. So th that's the sort of links in our constellation that are immutable and permanent. And Glippa is full of so many links and so many mentors, and I'm very fortunate for Waylena to have been one of mine. So thank you to our Waystar. So in 2009, I went to my first conference, and uh, I met Waylena, and she was, oh, you're a student, that's so great, um, and talking about GLPA and talking about the planetarium field. Um, I got back into the Glipper region in 2014, and I ran into Waylena, and we were talking for a long time, and she has definitely helped to shape my career as I move forward and also helped me get involved in GLPA. Um, and Waylena has been a huge mentor for a lot of us in the field, not just the people that are standing up here, but more as well. So my first clip was 2013 and Waylena took time, even though she was injured and could not move, <laughs> to get to know me and make me feel welcome. And she's part of the reason that it was so important to me to stay in Glippa. She encouraged me along the way. She made sure I got to go to the state meetings, even though I wasn't a part of Illinois. She made sure to know that that's where I belonged so I could stay involved, even in the, the off seasons. And um, I mean, she, I always had a standing, offered to come visit her in Champaign. Uh, she took extra time out of her day to teach me how to use Blender because I couldn't attend a workshop at Glippa because it was up against something else that I needed to attend. And so we sat in her lobby so she could teach me how to render a rotating Mars by myself. <laughs> because that's the kind of thing she does. She thinks solely of others. If I watch people, Throughout the conference, Waylena makes sure she gets to every single person and makes them know their value in the planetarium field, in life, and to her. And with Waylena, you know it's genuine, and you know you matter to her. And I would not be here if it weren't for you. You are the, excuse me, badass woman mentor that I so desperately needed in my life. And and I hope that I can be you when I grow up. Uh, I was asked uh, originally by Paulette to write a letter of support, and so I did. <laughs> and uh, it's like I love, I love Waylena so much. It's you know I just can't. It's like so I had a hard time putting it into words. So I'm going to read it. <laughs> um, so I was very honored to be asked to write a support for her because uh, she's always been encouraging, supportive, and welcoming. For me, I know I can count on her to give me the advice I need to make difficult decisions in my personal and professional life. She has always encouraged me to pursue roles I'm interested in in both Glippa and as well as within the planetarium community. She's also someone who always tries to make time for everyone and uh, tries to create a warm and welcoming community. She doesn't hesitate to help anyone who needs it, always tries to make sure people get the support and resources they need. Additionally, she is amazing with Blender and coding and stuff, and it's just, I can't, I can't even. I literally can't even. <laughs> it's, uh, it's so she's just so knowledgeable, and she just like, it's, expounds it. It's like, just needs to give it off to people because she just has so much. <laughs> You know, and uh, it's, she's just excited to share that, not, that information with anyone who asks and anyone who shows a vague interest of it. And she's just an amazing person. And I just can't, I cannot, I don't have enough words in my brain to say how amazing she is and how much I appreciate everything about her. And I just really hope that one day I can grow up to be her. <laughs> so. <laughs> So sorry to do that to you at the end of the awards, <laughs> but thank you so much for everything. Yeah, we'll take a quick breather so we can recover. <laughs>
see if I can do this. Here we are, right? <laughs> Time now for our Armin Spitz lecture. Before introducing Carrie, we all know who she is, so it's okay to you know, give it away right now, right? Yes. It is my honor and privilege to read to you the traditional excerpt from the 1967 letter written by Armin Spitz. You may have heard me say many times that, in my opinion, the full potential of planetarium, and I use the word in its broadest possible connotation, has yet barely been scratched. It is my earnest hope that the people who are chosen to be the Armin Spitz lecturers will be selected because of the fact that they have creative imaginations in this field and the courage to visualize the achievement of ideals in a practical way by the use of the planetarium instrument. I have always dreamed of its use to help produce more and better astronomers and I believe that this is now coming to pass. Perhaps I have dreamed equally long and earnestly about its being used as a catalyst to begin reactions which will help people to understand each other individually and collectively. So please, in your selection of speakers, choose those who are not ashamed to acknowledge that they have a dream. And let the point always be stressed that we as thinking beings occupy a unique vantage point in nature between the macrocosm and the microcosm, and that we have the intellectual capability of comprehending both. Very fitting, very fitting. <laughs> Carrie Berglund is a co-founder of Digitalis Education Solutions Inc. Now much of this is, is just stolen straight out of what was written in the, the notebook. So if I, if I stumble over it, you can read it there. Based in Bremerton, Washington, where she serves as Director of Education, she is very passionate about science education and its power to encourage critical thinking and engage the imagination. It's like it's right out of that letter. I know, I know. Prior to Digitalis, Carrie held numerous positions at Seattle's Pacific Science Center. She supervised the on-site Willard Smith Planetarium and live stage science programs, traveled to K through eight schools all over Washington state with the Science on Wheels outreach, outreach program, planned and led science-based summer camps and toured with the final year of the Science Carnival. Carrie founded and accessed Chief Instigator, I love that, I love that, for the Live Interactive Planetarium Symposium. How many here have participated in either the LIPS or the, uh, the, the mini versions associated with the regional conferences? In her spare time, and I had to include this because it means a lot to me, <laughs> Carrie enjoys volunteering at a local pause shelter for homeless cats and kittens. If you know me, you know I love cats. Space cats and earth cats, I, I love them all, and um, that's definitely been a bonding point for us. And uh, as many of us know, she is also an avid Elvis Costello fan. Uh, seeing him in concert as often as possible, and has an unabashed love of marsupials, especially quokkas. So, the daily quokka, yes, that. You kept it going, I mean, that's another, me that's been another survival, uh, survival piece for us to hang on to during these very troubled times. <laughs> Do 
GLPA Friends and Neighbors here to present the 2021 Spitz Lecture of Voice in the Dark, Carrie Berglund. Thank you, everybody, and thanks for that wonderful introduction, Waylena, and you so deserve that mentorship award. Uh, so I join everybody in thanking you for that. You've certainly been so welcoming to me. Um, so yes, I am here to present the Spitz Lecture. Um, I'm gonna try not to cry. Uh, I'm a little more emotional than I was expecting to be right at the start. Uh, I thought I would get to this point at the end, so we'll just see how it goes, okay? Um, so I wanted to tell you, I always like to tell people a little bit about what to expect. Um, so a quick overview of what I plan to talk about. Uh, I wanted to talk about why I chose that particular title. You may have some ideas. Uh, why in particular I think I was chosen. I wanted to give you a little bit of information about where LIPS came from, uh, what I've learned along the way from LIPS. And then I wanted to leave you with a challenge, but don't worry, it's, it's, it's not it's a scary one. And so, oh my goodness, how did I do that? Funny that there's Elvis Costello on my desktop. <laughs> totally unexpected. We'll just start there. Start. Upper slide. You know what, sometimes, I only recently broke down and bought reading glasses. I'm pretty proud of getting to 47 without glasses. This one work? It just doesn't want to work. Can you very help? This is being difficult. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to quickly close this and then I know what's on the next slide. And uh, while I get you thinking about that, I will reopen this and hopefully have more success if I can close it in the first place. My goodness, what a crazy thing. There we go, let's start from the first. Okay, sorry for that little interlude. It wouldn't be a presentation without a technology difficult, right? Uh, so I wanted to ask you this question, and if you know anything about me, you know that I'm not a lecturer, so I invite you to respond out loud. When you hear that term, a voice in the dark, what does it mean to you? A guide. A guide. Spooky. I didn't quite catch that, sorry. Spooky. Spooky, yeah. Don't go in the basement, right? Yeah, storytelling? Did I get that right? Yeah. Did I see anything over here? No? Oh, okay. Wisdom. Yeah. Consciousness. All right. Oh, interesting. A planetarium. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so when I was thinking about this, uh, lo and behold, it had something to do with Elvis Costello. I, I know, that's a real shock. But he has a, a, one of my very favorite songs that he has written is entitled A Voice in the Dark. And I put a little quote up there because it, it kind of sums up uh, what it means to me. Um, and you can read it there. You don't need, need me to read it to you because it might make me cry. Um, so for me, it, it has those positive, positive connotations that so many people were shouting out. Um, a path back to light or safety, kind of like a, a lighthouse acts as a warning to the boats, it's, uh, it helps get me, get me back to a safe place, uh, encouragement and support. But it does, I, I wanted to get that going because it does have that spooky horror movie thing. It's not always a good thing when you hear, if you're not expecting anybody in the room and you hear a voice, that can be a little frightening. And so I wanted to share some ideas about why I think I was chosen for this. I mean, it is definitely a big honor and I wanna thank the people who selected me. Uh, I have been around a while, which is a nice way to say that I'm old. Uh, so I've been in the planetarium field for over 25 years now. Um, I was honored to serve on the International Planetarium Society's Vision 2020 team. Is John Albert here? Yeah, back there, John led our team. Anna, wherever she went, right there, was a member of the team as well, as was Dantel. Uh, and so I had all these wonderful people that I got, I got to work very closely with. I was focused on professional development. Uh, that was my role. Um, as Waylena mentioned, I'm a co-founder of Digitalis. And if you have ever started your own business or even considered starting your own business, 
It's not something for the faint of heart. Uh, don't do it if you are risk averse. I'll just say that right there. Uh, and so I'm, I think that's part of why I was picked. Uh, I am willing to go to the edge of the cliff and jump off. Uh, <laughs> but it's been great. Uh, but the main reason is uh, that I am the founder, chief agitator of LIPS, or chief instigator is another term I frequently use, and the related spin-offs. I think that's the main reason I'm here. Uh, Waylena summed it up pretty well, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I did. I do have a background in the informal science education field. Um, anybody remember what my degree is actually in? Right. Very good. Keith knows. <laughs> Woo! Yes, but I did minor in American history. Um, yeah. Woo! -hoo. So yeah, obviously I have a great background for what I'm doing. Um, I learned a lot on the, on the fly, of course, um, and. I apparently did it okay. Uh, so I was in the education department at Pacific Science Center for many, many years. Um, I don't even know how many different jobs I held there. Uh, Waylena listed some of them, but there were others as well. Um, first planetarium I ever taught with was the Star Lab, good old cylinder-based Star Lab. I did that for several years doing outreach. And Waylena mentioned I did oversee the Willard Smith Planetarium for about a year. That was actually the very first planetarium I ever visited. I was 20 years old when I visited that planetarium, and it uh, stuck with me. And the reason I left PAXI, or PSC, um, was to co-found Digitalis. But I stuck with Science on Wheels because if you've ever started a business, you know that the first years are frequently lean, and it's nice to have another source of income. So uh, that was fun. And it was, it was great to stay attached to that part of the, the world as well. So LIPS, where did it come from? Uh, many of you know where LIPS comes from because you've been there. And in fact, we have a few people here who were at the very, very first one. Um, I started thinking about LIPS uh, really in detail in the fall of 2010. Um, and I had been thinking of just about the idea of um, a conference focused on interaction for many, many years, but we really started planning in 2010, and that was because Digitalis had just bought a building. You can see it there, it's a great building. If you're ever in the area, come and see me. It's a former fire station. Uh, it used to be Bremerton's Fire Station 1, the tall section. Ooh. Oh, laser pointer just decided to kick the bucket. Anyway, that tall section is the hose tower. Um, and we do, in fact, have some hoses left behind by the fire department. Thank you very much. They're very heavy, and we haven't moved them yet. Uh, but that was instrumental to organizing and hosting the first lips, was we finally had a place where we could do it. It's a 14,000-square-foot building um, with a, uh, I think on the next one, it'll tell you a little bit more about the facility, so I'm not going to do that. Um, I do like to mention that um, LIPS was born of frustration, and later on I'll talk about why that I mentioned that. Um, frustration with the status quo. Um, and it was in response to my big question about planetarium conferences, and I put the ellipse there to see if anybody knows what my big question was. It's something I've mentioned a couple of times over the years. No? Okay. Why are we all sitting in the dark not talking to each other? That was the big question. Um, it seemed like one of the reasons that we all come together for conferences is to share ideas. And if we're only listening, if the information is only flowing one way, we're missing a big opportunity. And so that was uh, one of the key points behind LIPS. And just to be clear, I put this in here so I would not forget to say it. I am not anti-full dome movie. I've had some people accuse me of that, and I'm, I'm really not. They have their place. Some of them are fantastic. Some of them are less fantastic. Um, but uh, my main point is that I am for maximizing the benefits of having everyone in the same place, that opportunity to share ideas face to face. Um, I think we all know, after having been through a couple years of not having that opportunity, we all know how much we missed it and how different it is if we're not in the same room. So the dream of LIPS. Um, I wanted to organize a professional development opportunity that maximized the opportunities for people to talk to each other. And that's during sessions, also during breaks and lunches. So breaks and lunches tend to be a little bit longer. 
uh, emphasizing the commonalities rather than the differences. So we don't break people into, oh, you're, you're a sponsor, oh, you use a Skyscan system, you use a Starlab, we don't do that. Everybody is all together and we talk about what we can do, what all of us can do. That's one of the big differences. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with doing user group meetings, those are definitely valuable because there are differences and you should do that. But it's also valuable to have everybody come together and share their experiences. And I also thought that we could do uh, create a level playing field for everyone. So it's a single sponsorship level, everybody gets the same benefits. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, flexibility and session links. So it's not a, it's not a you can only do uh, 15 or 30 minutes. If you need 25 minutes, we'll make it happen. So just offering that flexibility is really nice. Uh, presentation locations, we got some flexibility with that as well. And then the last one is something that I, I hear appreciated by many, many LIPS folks, um, having time in the evening just to relax or go out to dinner and socialize and think. Let those ideas that you picked up percolate inside your head. Um, and I want to pause here for a second because I know that we do have several regular LIPS attendees and even some previous LIPS hosts in the room. And I wanted to invite you to say something because this isn't all about me. Keith, how did I know? Do you want to come up here? Probably for microphone reasons for the online. Yes, I think so. I mean, I know Keith can project, but. <laughs> so, two things I want to say. One is that I think that Carrie deserves this award, if only for lips. And then you list all the other stuff she's done too, right? Um, the reason that I was the second host of lips is because. It was the very first conference I had gone to where we sat in a room and we talked about how we gave shows. And I was new and I needed that. And I'm not saying I wanted that. I needed that, it, whether I knew it or not. And so when Carrie looked around and said, hey, what do you think? Should we do this again? Is there anybody in the room that wants to host? I stood up and I said, I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but I'll do it because this absolutely must happen again. And if it happens again, hopefully it'll happen a whole bunch of more times. So that's what I want to say, is that I, it was a very different experience. And this is also a, a great and valuable experience, too, the style of conference that Clippa is. But we needed something more. And Carrie saw that and just made it happen. And I said, well, I can totally copy that and do it again. And that's what I did. And then, thankfully, it's continued on. So thanks again, Carrie. Mark Webb approaching the podium. Uh, I, I always like to point out that Mark was the very first person to register for LIPS 2011. Mm -hmm. Kevin over. It was easy because I was the person who had a conversation with Carrie where we really decided that you should do this. <laughs> so I knew about it early. Um, and I, I registered the very first time. Um, because I have been behind this from the beginning, I think that what Carrie has created here uh, has had a tremendous impact on our community, our industry. I, I, I don't think we realize um, how important it is, but before we started this, we were in kind of a, a doldrum uh, mode of presentation. And I think Carrie's work and Lips has revitalized the idea of people presenting to other people and, and interacting with them, getting their feedback, and beginning a conversation instead of holding a lecture or showing them a movie. And I am not anti full dome show either. <laughs> I, I, yes, they do have their place and they are absolutely essential. But just as essential is having that personal contact with your audience and the, the movement that Carrie has founded uh, is in fact, you know, where, as far as we've been able to bring that today. So yes, thank you. We 
great work people coming up too. This is awesome. Um, I want to especially thank Mark for taking on the role of sponsor liaison for Lips. That's been a, a load off my mind, off my plate. And now Martin Radcliffe, come on over. This is great. Well, it's like, okay, who's in this photo? You better stand up and say something. And I want to thank you personally. I mean, we go back a long way. And um, we were one of the first sponsors uh, to, this is a great idea. Uh, two things I wanted to say. First, I was working with Toshi Komatsu, who's on my left, right here, uh, who did a lot of live interactive time sharing shows, and we were trying to make that in the digital form. So we, he and I were working a lot of time together, so this worked well. Uh, one of the personal big pluses of this meeting was the guy on my left, because uh, in my uh, very early youth, I attended international astronomy youth camps, and um, uh, Yap Freeling, I met in 1981 and had not seen until this meeting uh, 25 years or something later. And it's like, oh my God. And then he and I met in Poland and he had trained a planetarian uh, who he called his astronomy daughter. And she and I hung out at the banquet in Poland and she invited me to Poland to give a talk with her live in a planetarium doing a live interactive planetarium show together, and her husband's a cosmologist, and so I love cosmology, as most of you know. And so we ended up just, you know, building that network is so huge, and you kind of have helped in that huge. Thank you, Mark. Gene Creighton, everybody. I'd like to say, I'd like to say two things also. One of the things I really enjoy about Carrie is to watch a leader, um, a woman who will stand up and do something really hard, and she shows how to do that with grace. So that's number one. Number two is there is a lot of collective wisdom here, and it is wonderful to have opportunities to tap into that. So these opportunities through LIPS give us a more explicit time to do that. So thank you. Thank you. Come up, Chris. Oh my gosh. <laughs> See, Joanne Young is not here this year, but she picked up really quickly that um, when I do a presentation, I actually do very, don't do very much presenting. I let other people present. Chris Seal. So two reasons, and, and one is, how, how many banquets like this have you seen, and there's a speaker, and they speak at you? No, look, look what she's doing. She's doing it again. <laughs> look at how engaged everybody is. We're, <laughs> Sorry. So, so there's one. Um, and Carrie, Carrie and I both started at Pacific Science Center at the same time. I took a wildly divergent career path and then came back to Spitz in 13 to discover that, oh, well, of course, Carrie's still doing her thing, and Carrie is doing this marvelous, like, riff on it, has, has created and started this, this whole new community. And in my time at Spitz, uh, we, here's a question. How many of you have ever heard a recording of Armand Spitz giving a presentation? Okay, we gotta fix that, because we, we turned one up a few years ago, and the, the man was legendary for a reason. He, is, he, he was spellbinding, and he was spellbinding with young children in a dark space, you've all experienced that, and he was spellbinding because he asked them questions and he got them engaged. And that, that is a thing that I think for a bit we were drifting away from. And so we'll, I'll, we'll, take, we'll get those audio recordings out to the community, but um, you know, you're, you're giving the Armand Spitz lecture and really bringing back what his gift was to it. And that, that's why I think it's so important for us to keep supporting what you're doing. So thanks, Gary. Carissa and Michael, oh my goodness. I didn't think I was gonna go to an hour, but I might. <laughs> First of all, Carrie, can I hug you really quick? <laughs> uh, you're very deserving of this. And um, I didn't come in early to all of LIPS, but in 2016 was my first one. And it was kind of my first 
conference, really, like major conference. Uh, and it was amazing to see kind of the culture that was created there. And I think, Carrie, a big value that you have really brought is kind of a place for a new kind of culture to bloom. Uh, and it has changed a lot in how I see everything. And, and I think it's changed a lot in the existing, you know, planetarium community. Uh, so I think it's just an amazing impact on how this started kind of small and has, I mean, you saw how many hands were up. <laughs> like it's touched everything that we do uh, and I think it's an amazing value. Thank you. And I do want to note that Carissa and Mike will be hosting LIPS 2023. So put that on your calendar. Yep. Um, I guess my job right now is going to be to make Carrie Brooklyn cry. <laughs> because I would not be here right now if it was not for you. <laughs> um, I was a planetarian and an educator for 15 years before I came to Spitz back in 2018. And in the time of trying to figure out whether or not that was the right next step for me, there was fear that the things that I loved, being a planetarian and an educator and being able to work with audiences and to inspire people, um, that that's something I wouldn't get to do anymore. And hosting LIPS in 2013 was one of the best professional experiences that I ever had. And I thought about you and the example that you have set, that you are a planetarian and an educator first, and that everything else is secondary to that, and that I could do that. And that I could not just continue to inspire people, but with lips and with you, that I could continue to be inspired. And so from the bottom of my heart. All right, thank you everybody. Michael is significantly taller than I am. There we go. <laughs> Thanks to everybody who spoke. Um, that was more than I expected. Uh, and I really appreciate it. As I mentioned, it, LIPS is not just me. It has never been just me. It has always been about the community. Um, it's a wonderful group that we have put together. Um, quick bit of LIPS history. I, I mentioned that Digitalis hosted the first one in 2011 at our old fire station. Uh, this fellow, many of you know from workshops, uh, his name is John Kaufman. He is fantastic. He is a former supervisor of the Willard Smith Planetarium, also a member of Jet City Improv, which was a Seattle improv group. And he did a, a keynote workshop for us on the first morning of LIPS, and it was just the best way to kick off that whole LIPS experience that I could have thought of. Um, he is uh, in theater program in leading a theater program in San Francisco now. He's a really cool guy. Um, we had, let's see, at LIPS 2011, we had a classroom space. We have a little dome, 6.1 meter dome, fiberglass. Used to be at the Lawrence Hall of Science. Uh, it's fantastic, I love it. Pacific Planetarium, can't wait till we can start doing shows again. It's only seats 28 people, so it's pretty small. Um, and I think I've hit everything on this slide in a different order, but that's okay. Uh, so we had about 40 people at the first lips, and I was young and foolish when I was thinking about this. I was like, oh man, what if, what if we actually break 100? <laughs> yeah, it didn't happen. But I was happy with, when we got to almost 40, and uh, we did have people from around the world, which honestly surprised me. I, you know, I figured we'd hit Canada, maybe Mexico, but we had people come from Thailand. We had Yap from the Netherlands. Um, uh, it was, and, and Kairu from Japan. That was the first time I had ever met her current IPS president. Um, and a quick note, if you didn't know that there's been nine in-person LIPS so far and the two virtual ones. So how is LIPS different? Um, 
I, I alluded earlier to the role of sponsors. So many of us um, in, who are sponsors now used to be behind the console. And not taking advantage of that wisdom uh, is foolish. And so we integrate sponsors into all of the sessions. There's no sponsor hall. Um, everybody has the opportunity to present, or we actually encourage they have a customer present about their equipment. And all those sponsor sessions should be live and interactive. Um, and we only do the 10 sponsors. And that's simply so that we keep the bulk of the schedule for non-sponsor attendee presentations. If we get a huge one on sponsors, like if we get 20 who want to sign up, we may have to revisit that. But right now, it's been working so far. Um, there's the first group, yeah. Uh, it was Rob, my partner's idea to get those little noisemaker lips. Yeah. Still, or Actually, I don't have mine, but Mark Webb loaned me one one time for a picture. Yeah, I don't have mine because I gave it to you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where it is now, but it's somewhere. Uh, so, um, yeah, the one session strand. So, we all stay together for sessions at LIPS, and what happens is that by the end of the three days, we all know each other really, really well, and it creates a co cohesive unit that I honestly wasn't expecting, because if we had gotten to 100 people in the first one, there's, there's no way. We were able to cram all, almost 40 people in our dome with some people sitting on the floor, and we have bench seating. No way we could have done 100 in there. It's only 6.1 meters. Um, so that was a happy accident that we've just kept over the years. Um, Shortish conference days, long breaks, I mentioned those earlier. So there's time for socializing, kicking around ideas, just letting things soak in. Um, flexible session links I talked about earlier. And the hosts get to keep any overrun. Um, not that we encourage gouging, but we do encourage you to cover your costs. And if there's a little bit left over, hey, that's great. Oh, and uh, if I can go back one. Uh, I had to put this picture in here because one of my jokes about lips is that we always have to move furniture. And so uh, the first one, we had rented a bunch of tables and chairs. We hadn't bought enough yet for everybody. And so we rented them and people were, you know, people stuck around after it and helped us load the tables and chairs. It was great. Uh, and so I wanted to talk about the people who helped me get to where I am today. Does anybody in this room actually know Dennis Schatz? Oh, okay. Good, I, I figured that Martin would. I wasn't sure about the others. Um, oh, yeah, and Dale, of course. Uh, Dennis Schatz is an uh, amazing person. He was Associate Director of Education at Pacific Science Center for many, many years. He uh, was one of the original people involved in getting the Willard Smith into Pacific Science Center. He's written 26 books on astronomy, and he's just a really nice, supportive guy. Um, I wouldn't be here without Dennis. And I'm gonna cry now, but. Let's see, okay. And he does have an asteroid named after him. I put that up there. And I'll stop crying now that I think about that. Uh, this one, this is very coronavirus centric. Um, I lucked into this group, the Immobile Tour Backstage. Um, you know, funny, the name Elvis Costello is gonna come up a lot in this uh, session. That's him there on the right, that series, and in the, the lower right of the center shot. Um, Elvis's keyboardist, Steve Naive, uh, just felt a real need to start a community during the coronavirus. He was missing performing, missing being with people. And so he started this amazing thing that he called the Immobile Tour Backstage. And it was about 100 of us that paid a ridiculously low amount. It was like $10 a month. And we got to attend these virtual conferences and connect with people. And it was just a beautiful thing. And they would play music, and they would tour us around their house. Uh, on the left there, you can see the, the tall fellow with the stripy shirt. His name is Quesada. Uh, he is the son of Steve's partner, Muriel. Uh, she was behind the, she'd be on the camera for most of them. Uh, but they just toured us around the house. They would chat with people. And then they'd play these great songs. And it was just a wonderful, wonderful thing. And since Steve works with Elvis a lot, Elvis was frequently a guest. Um, and so the reason I mentioned them was that the Immobile Tour Backstage, IDB, highlights the importance of personal connections and builds that sense of community that I think is also true of LIPS. Um, I did want to talk just a little bit about this man. 
So I have listened to him for many, many years. He is not only one of my favorite musicians, but I also of great interest to me. He is a role model for me, I think, because he is curious, he is open-minded, and he just loves to learn new things. And that is what I try to do. Um, he trusts in his audience, which is important from a lips perspective. Uh, and an example of that, um, he, he doesn't like to tell people what his song is about because he doesn't want to affect their interpretation of it. Instead, he says, you, you decide what it means to you. And that's pretty cool. A lot of musicians feel the need to explain it. Um, he's a brilliant songwriter. He's eloquent, articulate, memorable. Uh, he says what he means, and he means what he says. And so that is something I try to do, but I'm not so good at. Um, I did want to put one quote just to show you what I'm talking about. Uh, you, you can get members of the audience who say, keep out of politics. I'm not in politics. You won't find a manifesto in any of my songs, but you will find a point of view. So I'll say what I damn well please, and you don't have to listen. So yeah, I try to remember that. <laughs> yeah, and you'll see a bunch of pictures here. I've seen him five times this year. Yeah, not like I'm addicted or anything. Um, I mentioned that he's very articulate. I wanted to share a couple, a few quotes and just tell you why I picked them. Um, the first one, some of you Elvis fans, and I know there are some out there, though I won't put you on the spot, uh, is from Accidents Will Happen, 1979. Uh, it's the damage that we do and never know. It's the words that we don't say that scare me so, which I think is wise beyond his years. He was 24 years old when he wrote those songs. Uh, the second one, now I try hard not to become hysterical, but I'm not sure if I am laughing or crying. <laughs> like right now, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I was 14, and that meant a lot. Ooh, okay, <laughs> don't worry, I'm going to get it together. Uh, so this one, this next one, is a, a more interesting one. This is from a song, uh, an album he released last year. I don't spend my time perfecting the past. I live for the future because I know it won't last. He's um, 67, and while that's older than I am, I, I've definitely passed the halfway point now, um, and I think about that. And then the last one I just had to throw in because it's, it's a good astronomy tie. Last rays of sunlight die, full moon begins to rise. Um, and I just, I like the, the fact of communicating a science concept like that in such a, a brief, memorable way. And it's accurate. Is that why you're laughing? Yeah, it's, it's just a great, great quote. Anyway, uh, he has been a long time voice in the dark for me. So lips. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, this one's got Martin in it too. <laughs> This was from an, uh, an exercise that John Kaufman did um, called Thank You, I Have Failed, where he asked us to show poses of failure and then encouraged us to open back up and uh, instead move from that, that pose of failure to a pose of success. And I just couldn't resist putting that picture in there. Um, yes, good things can indeed come from frustration. Um, I mentioned that lips did come from a sense of frustration, but... Um, we have put together a solid, strong community that I, I think is really making a big difference in the world, and I am very proud of us. Um, people do want to be a part of a community, uh, and I think that, as I mentioned with the Immobile Tour backstage, I think that was especially true during these lockdowns and uh, isolation. A few other lessons, everyone, everyone has something to contribute, and that's true not only of us here at conferences, but from our audiences as well. I have used this picture in the past. I am using it here because the shadow puppets, oh my god, the shadow puppets were so fun. Um, that was LIPS 2018 at Pacific Science Center, as a matter of fact. Uh, it was led by a, a young woman from the Museum of Flight. It was her first conference of any kind ever, and she presented, she did a fantastic job, and I remember it to this day. And Carissa got to use a puppet, and I was very, very jealous. <laughs> Uh, and then the, the other thing, the big thing, the more you give, the more you get. Um, I, yes, I have given a lot to the community, but I have gotten so much more. So I thank everybody for that. So now I leave you with your challenge. I challenge you to be the voice in the dark. Not the scary kind, the good kind. Uh, 
And I'm gonna, just gonna give you a few ideas. Um, you might mentor new planetarians. We have several who have won mentorship awards in this room right now. We have others who do it but haven't yet won those awards. If you're not doing it, give it a shot. When you interact with your audiences, do it sincerely and meaningfully. You never know, there might be a young planetarian in your audience. Uh, lead conference sessions, if this is what you wanna see, then do it. Embody the change you want to see. That's something we hear a lot. Uh, model what science is and what it is not. That's really important. Uh, be open-minded and curious. There is more than one point of view to everything, and be open. And I, did, I wanted to come back to those two, not to be a downer, but I did wanna share some quotes that I have read over the past few months uh, that really made me think. Um, Rob, my partner, who co-founded Digitalis with me, is an economics major, and so we get the Wall Street Journal at home. Uh, and I have to say, I've grown to really like it. They have some interesting articles in them, and um, this was an editorial. I'll go ahead and read the, the quote. Um, it's uh, from Gary Saul Morrison, Partisan Science in America, written um, just about a month ago. Wow, exactly a month ago. Science operates by a process of criticism. If a scientific periodical expels editors or peer reviewers because they don't accept some prevailing theory, that process has been short-circuited. Those who call for such expulsions have missed the whole point of how science works. They are the true deniers, far more dangerous to science than a religious fundamentalist who believes the world is 6,000 years old. And that was uh, in response to the peer-reviewed journals um, where editors were being kicked off because they didn't accept the prevailing view. Um, and another one uh, from July, this one was really interesting to me because it, it encapsulated what I was trying to put together in my head. Uh, this is from a, a British fellow named Matt Ridley. Uh, what does it mean to believe in science? We've heard that a lot over the, over the past few months. Uh, the British science writer Matt Ridley draws a pointed distinction, distinction between science as a philosophy and science as an institution. The former grows out of the Enlightenment, which Mr. Ridley defines as the primacy of rational and objective reasoning. The latter, like all human institutions, is erratic, prone to falling well short of its stated principles. Mr. Ridley says the COVID pandemic has thrown into sharp relief the disconnect between science as a philosophy and science as an institution. So I'll let you th think about that. Draw your own conclusions. But I didn't want to end on a, on a down note. I did want to give you one final idea for being a voice in the dark, and that is to give people a reason to smile. This one's for you, Elita. <laughs> If you know anything about me, you know that I typically show cats on the dome. If I do a sponsor presentation, I didn't do that this year, so here you go. These are some of the many cats and kittens that I have come to know, especially during this pandemic when I wasn't traveling. Um, so I share them with you. They are all adorable. And if you're not smiling right now, I don't want to know you. <laughs> Just kidding. And so, one last thing, uh, I wanted to give a plug for LIPS 2022 in August. Um, finally, oh, fingers crossed, finally going to be getting to the Fisk Planetarium at the University of Colorado Boulder they were supposed to host in 2020. You know what happened then? Uh, and then we were gonna try for 2021 and it wasn't looking good. So I approached the Carnegie so we could do it a little later in the year and it still didn't, it wasn't gonna happen in person, it just wasn't. Um, and so next year, August 2nd, or August 3rd through 5th will be the main lips days and an optional kinesthetic astronomy workshop the day before. Um, and if you take a look at that picture, our hosts look like they're gonna be kind of fun. Yeah, so hopefully you'll be able to join us for that. And that brings me to the end. Uh, thank you very much for the honor of being up here and speaking to you. It has been a pleasure to be part of this community. Um, and uh, yes, if you're curious about what that little critter is, that is a, a quokka, a marsupial native to Western Australia. Um, and I did list two ways you can get involved in the LIPS community if you're not already. One is to join the uh, 
uh, LIPS Facebook group. It's a closed group, but uh, send a request to join and I'll approve it. Um, or send me an email and tell me you want to be part of the LIPS Google group and I put my email there as well. So once again, thank you so much for this honor and thank you to everybody who spoke and said such wonderful things and I'm proud that I didn't actually break down, although I came pretty close. Uh, so thank you. One last thank you to everybody who told me they were looking forward to this. You really propped me up, and I appreciate that so much. This concludes our banquet. I am so, so thrilled to, to be here with all of you. We do, however, have a few announcements. So. Okay, I have a couple of quick things because I know that you want to get to the hospitality suite. Very briefly, I've been trying to catch up on the booklets that were prepared by Eric Schroer. Uh, if you've had a chance to look at them, they're beautiful. And I was remiss in my thank yous earlier, but Eric was very, very helpful also in the planning of the conference and in opening up his home for observing and uh, doing many other things, but including the sharing of this booklet that he has put together. There's a few people that need to pick them up, both sponsors and um, individual delegates. So I'd like to get those taken care of because uh, not only are you anxious for the hospitality suite, is that uh, my fiance is gonna is on our way here, and I would, it's been a long week. <laughs> and I really need to thank her, too. <laughs> uh, all right, so booklets, and a thank you to Eric, and also a thank you to Renee Kerrigan. Thank you. <laughs> Who picked black pink? Right. 